Welcome back everyone, I'm Jordan Giesegi and this is The Limiting Factor. One of the biggest surprises of the 4680 teardown was that there was no silicon in the anode of the battery cell. This is in contrast to Battery Day, where Tesla teased a polymer-coated silicon anode material that would provide up to 20% greater range through higher energy density. That is, there's a big discrepancy here between the expectations many people had and reality. So that's what we're going to cover today in the third video of the 4680 teardown series. What are the implications of a pure graphite anode? Why did Tesla make this design choice? And finally, is this a bad omen for Tesla's polymer-coated silicon technology? Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. This is the support that gives me the freedom to avoid chasing the algorithm and sponsors. As always, the links for support are in the description. Additionally, this entire series wouldn't have been possible without the battery cell provided by Galley of Hyperchange and Corey Coddington, who delivered the battery cell to UC San Diego. At UC San Diego, Shirley Mung organized funding for the teardown as the Zabel Endowed Chair in Energy Technologies and Jacobs School of Engineering. And finally, Wai Kong Lee spent many hours working on the teardown and answering my questions. So, a big thanks to everyone involved. First, let's look at the implications of a pure graphite silicon-free anode, starting with the energy density. Typically, the anode of a battery cell uses graphite to store lithium ions in a process called intercalation. During intercalation, lithium ions are stored in the graphite host structure at one lithium atom to six carbon atoms. The benefit here is that the graphite expands very little during intercalation, which avoids structural stresses in the anode, which leads to good cycle life. But the drawback is that the graphite host structure is dead weight, and dead weight has a negative effect on energy density. With a silicon anode, rather than using a host structure to store lithium ions, the lithium ions alloy directly with silicon, and the lithiated silicon expands in volume by 300%. Without the dead weight of a host structure, silicon has an energy density that's roughly nine times greater than graphite. But, as Tesla pointed out at Battery Day, the lithium expansion is destructive. The silicon particles can crack apart, become electrically isolated through delamination, and they can tear apart the protective film, or SEI layer, that helps batteries last hundreds or thousands of cycles. What Tesla proposed at Battery Day was to stabilize the silicon with an elastic, ion-conducting polymer in combination with a highly elastic binder. With that technology, Tesla was expecting to eventually increase energy density by about 20% at the pack level. If you'd like to know more about how Tesla might achieve that, check out my Cracking the Silicon Code video. I say eventually increase energy density by about 20% for two reasons. First, Tesla advised at Battery Day that the horizon for the technologies they unveiled was three years or thereabouts. Second, as I advised in past videos, like the rest of the industry, it was unlikely that Tesla was going to go from a low loading of silicon to a high loading of silicon in the first generation 4680 battery cell. It's better to increase silicon incrementally to de-risk the 4680 production ramp. I didn't expect no silicon. That was a surprise. But no silicon makes sense as well. More on that later. Despite the fact that the 4680 contained no silicon, UC San Diego calculated that Tesla was able to achieve an energy density of at least 272 watt-hours per kilogram. Matt Lacey on Twitter calculated that it could be more like 250 watt-hours per kilogram, plus or minus 10 watt-hours per kilogram. Either way, the mid to high 200 watt-hours per kilogram range is on par with advanced chemistries that do contain silicon. That is, the fact that the 4680 contained no silicon hasn't handicapped the cell in terms of energy density. This is because Tesla was able to use a cathode that was 20 to 25% thicker than the 60 to 70 micron cathodes currently used in 2170 battery cells. A thicker cathode means a higher ratio of active energy storing material to inactive materials, like the current collector. And more energy storing material, of course, means higher energy density. Let's move on to charging speed. Another benefit that silicon has over graphite is that it allows for faster charging rates. With a graphite anode, the lithium ions scramble to find and enter empty spaces within the graphite host structure. 
This traffic jam becomes progressively worse as the battery charges, and it's part of the reason why the charge rate becomes slower at higher states of charge. With silicon, the silicon particles rapidly soak up thousands of lithium ions each, like a sponge, and any traffic jam effect is minimal. From my point of view, this is where we start to see some unexpected behavior from Tesla's 4680 battery cell. We might have expected a Tesla vehicle using a silicon-free 4680 to have a slower charge rate than a vehicle using 2170 cells. This is because a vehicle using 4680 cells should see more of a traffic jam during charging due to the pure graphite anode. Instead, they're about neck and neck in terms of charge speed. Tom Milani of the YouTube channel State of Charge tested a Model 3 using 2170 battery cells that are known to contain silicon and achieved an 80% charge in 32 minutes. The kilowatts achieved the same charge rate from a made-in-Texas Model Y that contained 4680 battery cells, which contained no silicon. As a side note, why do I assume the Texas-made Model Y contained no silicon? Although the cell UC San Diego tested wasn't from a 4680 cell from a production vehicle, I'm assuming the current production cells are also silicon-free based on advice from the Tesla Q2 2022 earnings call. In response to a question about Tesla silicon-free anodes, Drew Baglino stated that, quote, Our priority was really on simplicity and scale during the initial 4680 and structural battery ramp. But, as we attain the manufacturing goals that we've stated at the ramp we need to hit next year, we are certainly planning to layer in new material technologies. End quote. How did Tesla achieve a good charge rate in the 4680 battery packs, despite the fact that it probably didn't contain silicon? It could be for a number of reasons, but a contributing factor might be the dry electrode coating that I pointed out in the last video. Dry electrode coatings can allow for higher charge and discharge rates because the dry coating creates a series of point-to-point -point connections at the particle level, which is beneficial for ion flow. With a wet coating, the binder coats the active material particles, which blocks ion flow. Regardless, the point here is that despite the fact that Tesla didn't use silicon in their 4680, it doesn't appear to have handicapped the battery cell in terms of charging speed. With regards to power density and power output, I need to wait for the Monroe-sourced 4680 battery cell and run it through its paces. But things are looking good so far. Sandy Monroe's confirmed that the 4680 is quite a powerhouse and has twice the power output they expected. Let's move on to scalability. Tesla Silicon will be able to scale more quickly than graphite for two reasons. First, the energy capacity of silicon is nine times greater than graphite, so roughly nine times less silicon will be needed for each unit of lithium storing capacity. Second, silicon is abundant. This is especially true of the metallurgical grade silicon Tesla will be using, which is more widely available because it's lower purity and requires less specialized refining capacity. With regards to the image on screen, 2N means 99%. 5N means 99.999% and so on. The N refers to the number of nines. Tesla said metallurgical grade at battery day, which is 2N silicon and only 99% pure. With that said, although silicon will make it easier for Tesla to scale due to silicon's higher energy capacity and broader availability, it won't make scaling dramatically easier. Why? Because graphite will still be needed in large quantities to complement the silicon. More on that in a moment. As a side note, you may be wondering why Tesla would only get a 20% range or energy density increase from using an anode material with nine times higher energy capacity. First, they'll be mixing the silicon with graphite because graphite will buffer the silicon expansion and extend cycle life. Even in a best case scenario, I'd be surprised if we saw much more than 10% silicon by weight in the anode in the next couple of years. And longer term, 20-30% to silicon by weight is probably the maximum in the next five years. Second, the graphite anode only makes up about 22% of the weight of the battery cell. That means there are diminishing returns in terms of energy density when adding silicon. For example, adding 30% silicon by weight increases the total energy capacity by 24%. Bridging the remaining 70% gap to 100% silicon only nets 8% more energy capacity. Finally, what are the implications of a silicon-free graphite anode in terms of cost? On a dollars per kilowatt hour basis, Tesla expects their in-house silicon to save 5% at the pack level, which is about 6% at the cell level. 
Why so little? Graphite is already fairly low cost and high energy density. So, on a dollars per kilowatt hour basis, it's cheap and only makes up 9% of the cell cost. That is, a 6% cost savings at the cell level against a maximum of 9% is good on a relative basis, but on an absolute basis, it isn't earth shattering. Furthermore, the first iteration of Tesla Silicon will probably save closer to 2% rather than 6% because Tesla won't start with the maximum silicon loading. For comparison, Tesla will probably save 10 to 20% on their in-house battery cells just by avoiding third-party premiums, shipping, and taxes. So, getting the 4680 line working is a much bigger priority than saving less than 6% at the cell level from Tesla Silicon. However, let's dig a bit deeper on cost because there's more to the story. We've only been talking about cost savings on a dollars per kilowatt hour basis. Dollars per kilowatt hour doesn't take into account cycle life. Most automotive lithium ion battery cells should last up to about a thousand cycles. So as long as the battery cell can get in that ballpark, it'll provide well over 200,000 miles of range. And that's enough for most people. But heavy duty use cases like energy storage are a different story. The more cycles, the better. And for high cycle life, graphite is king. With a pure graphite anode, you can expect well over 2,000 cycles from a high-end nickel-based battery cell rather than 1,000 cycles. Although the battery cell would be slightly more expensive in terms of unit cost, it's more than made up for by the additional cycles for commercial use cases that require high durability. In the past, I said that I'd be very surprised if Tesla could crack a thousand cycles with a high silicon anode, and that Tesla might pursue a split chemistry pathway where they produce a graphite-based workhorse chemistry for energy storage and a silicon-based mobility chemistry for vehicles. Since then, there are two indications that might be correct and that Tesla could, at some point, pursue a split chemistry pathway. First, Elon recently stated on Twitter that high cycle life is possible with a nickel cathode, if optimizing for that. In the same tweet, he also said that adding silicon to the anode increases energy density, but decreases cycle life. That is, there's a high cycle life pathway and a high energy density pathway available. Although Elon appears to be specifically referring to nickel chemistries here, the same is true for iron-based chemistries. Second, Panasonic has outright stated in a recent presentation that they're pursuing a split pathway for the 2170 battery cells, a high capacity pathway and a long life pathway that offers high power. As a side note, if the 4680s Tesla used in the Austin Model Y use a pure graphite anode, will they have a higher cycle life than the vehicles using 2170s from Panasonic that do use silicon? The answer is that if all the components in the battery cell are comparable in quality to the Panasonic 2170s, then the answer would likely be yes. But that comes with a big caveat. Cycle life is dependent on several factors, such as cathode particle design, material thicknesses, graphite quality, and electrolyte formulation. We do know that Tesla's changed several of these with the 4680, so there's not a definitive answer here on whether the cycle life will actually be longer. In summary, is it a concern that Tesla doesn't appear to be using their polymer-coated silicon technology in the 4680 battery cell? It's simply too early to say because Tesla currently has their hands full with getting 4680 production operational. Furthermore, at this point in time, it's a non-issue. The current silicon-free iteration of the 4680 is comparable to the best cells on the market in terms of energy density, power density, scalability, and cost. It also offers the possibility of higher cycle life, and it's possible that Tesla will eventually pursue a split pathway, with some cells using pure graphite and others that leverage silicon. And that's true for both nickel chemistries and iron-based chemistries. Cathodes and anodes can be mixed and matched with each other based on what materials are available and what Tesla's needs are, whether that be grid storage or a roadster. Silicon will become increasingly useful in the future, but at the moment, it's not the be-all and end-all. There's no free lunch with batteries. There's always a trade-off, and it's rare to find a significant improvement to lithium-ion batteries that doesn't also come with drawbacks. High silicon anodes sound like the new hotness because they can dramatically improve energy density and charge speed, but they also nerf cycle life. The humble graphite anode is often looked down on because it's viewed as old technology or mundane, but it's really quite a miracle. It has about double the lithium capacity of most common cathode materials, which means it's actually the cathode that's the true limiting factor in the battery cell. 
It has an excellent voltage potential that's near zero, it's relatively inexpensive, and in terms of scalability, graphite can be found naturally in geologic formations or can be manufactured with a synthetic process. If all that wasn't enough, as Jeff Don's research has shown, a high-quality synthetic pure graphite battery cell with the right electrolyte and cathode is exceedingly stable, with a potential service life of millions of miles in a vehicle or decades when cycled daily in grid storage. Those cells can be made with commercially available materials and would only be slightly more expensive than a high-energy automotive cell. On that note, some people are wondering whether the Tesla cell used a natural or synthetic anode. That's a topic for another video, and I don't have a definitive answer yet, but that should change after the 4680 cell from Monroe & Associates is analyzed. Some people are also asking me about an ETA for the battery cell from Monroe. As at the time of writing this script, it should be shipped mid-September. After that, it's dependent on when UC San Diego has time to do the characterization, what we find, and how quickly I can produce a video. I'll do all that as quickly as I can. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video or as a YouTube member. You can find the details in the description. A special thanks to Lucas Maruri, Todd Morgan, Gort, Victor Peer, and Henry Abanto for your generous support of the channel, my YouTube members, and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.